webinar in this new FYI 2014 webinar series uh, hosted by Caucus. Uh, thank you for joining us from near and far this morning. Uh, today's webinar is Why Portugal is an Ideal Investment Opportunity. So uh, lots of information on why Portugal is a great place to invest um, in technology and textiles and talent, but also should be considered as a location uh, to set up uh, perhaps your European headquarters or even open uh, a business. Our presentation today is given by Fui Boavista Marques, who is the Trade and Investment Commissioner for ICEP, uh, the Portugal Global Trade and Investment Agency. Just a, a quick housekeeping item. Um, everybody is on uh, listen-only mode, so if you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar console and we will uh, ask the questions uh, to Rui at the end of the presentation. If you think of additional questions after the webinar, you can always send them to us directly at talkus at talkus.org. So just a quick introduction to our presenter today. Um, again, if we will be to Marks, Trade and Investment Commissioner, this is his contact information, and he is encouraging everybody to reach out to him with questions and um, ideas if you have anything uh, after this presentation. And below there is the website um, for ICEP as well. So with that, I'm going to hand over control to Hui so he can get started on his presentation. So thank you, Hui, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, hello, everybody. I want to begin by thank Palcos and in particular Angela Simões for taking the lead and um, organizing so many great um, uh, events uh, all over the U.S. and particularly this series of webinars. Um, and, and again, thank you, Paulus, and thank you, Angela Simons, for this opportunity. So you heard my name is Rui Bobista Marx. I've been here in the U.S. for the last three years. I tend to go around. I have an international career. I spent uh, most, um, uh, actually, more than 12 years in Asia, most of the time based in, in Tokyo, where I open offices in Seoul, in Beijing, in Taipei, and have um, and run a, a program of trainees in Singapore, and Hong Kong, and all around Asia. And then I. I, I spent some time in, in, uh, in Europe, um, uh, in, namely in Scandinavia first for four years and then eight years in, in Germany before going to Portugal um, for three years just before coming to the States now. And I'm very pleased to represent Portugal, Portuguese economic interests here in the States. And you heard the name of the institution I work for, so it's a typical trade and investment agency. Um, uh, that we um, have three main areas of work here in our office in, in New York, um, which is um, promote um, the exports of innovative products to the U.S. We have more than 2,200 companies regularly exporting to the U.S. and you will see in, in, in a couple of minutes um, the level of innovation we have in our products to give you an idea uh, last year alone we export 2.5 times more to the US than the US exported to Portugal we are a rare case of very successful positioning of a smaller country in, U in the US um, in the last 17 years we've been exporting more to the US than the US to Portugal so we have a positive trade balance and we have tremendous um, array of innovative and very competitive um, goods and services coming into the US. I will talk a little bit more about that but just to give an idea so it, promoting exports is the first pillar of our uh, work here in, 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 our, in our office in the US based in New York. The second will be to introduce uh, Portuguese companies to the American market on a more so, um, sort of um, um, intense way, so um, helping companies to invest in the US. It's not that we are so much concerned about creating jobs here, but just that, that we believe that by accessing new markets, new technology, new management techniques, um, the Portuguese companies will have access to um, different um, markets also. So we also promote investment of Portuguese companies here in the US. And the third and really relevant um, area of activity these days is to attract American investors in all sorts of range to Portugal. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that also because we have uh, very successful American companies in Portugal 
we're very proud that they, they create uh, wealth and, and drop those in Portugal and we'll talk about that. So let's go, um, we talk, I already sent photos, I talked a little bit about my, my, my profile and uh, about ISEP. Let's see um, um, a little bit more about these four areas that I would like to introduce to you. We will, um, I will um, give you sort of 10 reasons why you should look at Portugal when thinking about going global. Uh, then it's very important to know a little bit about um, our the state of the art of industrial and service sectors in Portugal. What do we do there? What is the benchmark? And how we compare also with other international partners. Then, of course, you heard then almost three years ago, we entered into an adjustment reform in our economy. And I'm going to show you why in the 17th of May, actually, just a couple of months ahead, uh, we are going to conclude that uh, program where we receive international funds from the FMI, the um, European Bank and the European Commission. And, and I'm going to show to you how um, the level of competitiveness that we gain during this uh, three year of adjustment process through reform. And this is very important. And I will just pinpoint at the very end um, the, the reforms that we did to attract investors and you'll be uh, very, very eager to know about our golden visa program uh, or our flat rate, uh, flat um, tax rate for expats that are um, the most competitive uh, in the world these days. So let's go for it. And um, uh, to, if if I would have to sum up uh, to someone that gives me not uh, the three minute speech but like um, a thirty second speech uh, about Portugal, I I would just resume in this. Um, in this um, slide, let's say the more hard factors in the left side and the more soft skill sectors. So I'll have I'll just speed away and say, look, we have a unique strategic location. We are the closest European country to the US. We are uh, very close to 500 million market in the European Union. Very. Um, qualified and competent market where we compete very well, but we also have a lot of talent. So the qualified workforce is outstanding. That's why MIT, Harvard Medical, Carnegie Mellon, uh, University of Austin in Texas have offices in Portugal and they decided I mean, if you, I will just mention that later, but if you go to the site of MIT, they say that they're, that the most profitable, the most interesting international partnership they have is with MIT Portugal. So qualified workforce, very interesting set of competitive costs, high quality infrastructure that you will never saw here in the United States. You will see a broadband penetration, highways, you see a very well interconnect country and a business friend environment and a very proactive tax incentives and grants to greet investors. So this will be a package that I'll, that's a 30 seconds uh, about a pitch that I'll say, look, this is why Portugal is very special, but I will have to add something more on the soft skill side, that we are used to talk with foreigners. We've been on the global arena for centuries and then we have a very dynamic approach. And of course we know um, how to focus on, on client, on investor needs. We have a lot of flexibility. We know how to um, embrace partnerships and joint ventures. We are very focused, very pragmatic and we have one of the best tailored incentives package these days. So therefore, just for you to know, my approach, will, I'll, I'll blend these two um, somehow more hard factors with the soft skills and um, that's how we would sum up. Let's go into a little bit more detail into some of these um, factors that I just sum up. For example, if you talk about the strategic location, you know it. We are the closest to the US and we have a huge market. We blend the, the excess um, um, to two markets. So the almost 500 million of the European Union with um, a great and privileged economic relationship with um, the Portuguese speaking uh, countries. And who are they? We're talking about 250 million of Portuguese speaking people and business people around the world with eight countries. Of course, you know about Brazil, but Angola and Mozambique are definitely countries that are on the emerging markets with uh, one of the highest growth um, and with a great potential and we are the ideal 
partners to that world also. But um, you see here um, a little bit in more detail, you see that for example we have five postgraduate education partnerships worldwide. One is in uh, Germany, the Fraunhofer Network, and the other four are here in the US. We're very proud of these partnerships. They have only been running for almost five years. We just renegotiate with four because Harvard Medical uh, began a little bit later. Uh, and we are now in the second phase. So we are, uh, just for you to see the level of commitment of the Portuguese government, we signed contracts with these five institutions for at least 10 years and we are really very committed to that. Therefore, you'll see not only the world-class education level that we have, but also the multi-language skills and we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know that, um, for example, Cisco and HP or Xerox have worldwide global centers in Portugal because of this. Because if you know that um, an average Portuguese speaks, of course, for English for sure, but he speaks French also. Sometimes he speaks German, and he speaks. And you can imagine if he speaks English, French, and and Spanish just like that, um, he will be able to cover, for example, a call center for Cisco. That's what they do in. Um, Africa, Middle East, and Europe. And that's why we are so um, attractive, actually so competitive for uh, shared service centers. On the competitive cost side, uh, we do, this is, I mean, international benchmark um, data, so you can find them in, 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 in several professional uh, service providers. It's well known that Portugal has energy costs that are well above the other Europe, European partners, that our labor costs reduce, especially now during these three years of economic adjustment, and in terms of real estate, um, um, the price competitiveness, it's outstanding, especially if you compare with um, places like Madrid, Barcelona, or uh, Krakow, or Czech Republic, um, you, you would see um, a very interesting package of uh, competitiveness. Now, there is a couple of things that you really have to um, think um, when you put Portugal in the, in the global map these days. And for example, the Sinch, the Sinch port, which is a port just south of, of Lisbon, between Lisbon and, and Algarve, if you are uh, familiarized with the geography there. Um, look, in my job, I tour around in the United States. So I go around, and uh, especially when, I, when you talk about infrastructure, logistics and ports, everybody knows and rise their eyes about what's happening in Sinch now because it's um, 20, eight meters, so almost 96 feet natural bed, um, uh, seabed um, port. So if you think, for example, what Miami, Norfolk, all, all the, the ports here um, in the East Coast have to do to receive the post-Panamax when the, the largest ships in the world when they will cross the Panama Canal. And all the work and the investment that will have to be done in all the um, American ports to receive those boats, those large ships, in, since it's already there, it's natural, it's 90 feet, 96 feet deep. And um, uh, some of our Asian partners, um, like Singapore, that is managing exactly, if you see the picture on the top, is managing that um, wonderful new transshipment, as we call it, platform, so uh, it's for, for trade, for example, with Asia, can you imagine that without going to all the um, very congestion ports in the northern Europe, like Amsterdam or Hamburg, you can just come with the big ships here in the west coast of Portugal and transship uh, all the cargo to smaller boats that can go either to the south of the Mediterranean Sea or either to the north of Northern Europe. And that's this port of, of Sins is going to play a very important role in, um, in the future in terms of logistics and it's creating one of the most exciting novelties in logistics and transport in the current days. Now, um, in terms of information and communication technology infrastructure, um, we have been 
winning prizes of, as you can see, the United Nations Public Service Awards. Um, we've been winning these sort of prizes for online public services. And as you know, if you travel in Portugal, you'll see the, the number of, um, of services that we provide in the ATM. In any ATM, you can, you can pay your taxes, you can um, buy um, um, movie theater uh, tickets. We are the country that has the largest, by far, the largest number of services in ATMs and online, and especially when it um, it um, it takes to um, when you we're to, when you're talking about public services. So this is a very important. Of course, it features also well with other aspects like the broadband penetration, that we are really on the top. 20 of the highest use of optical fiber and broadband access, but uh, it's interesting to see also that uh, the level of sophistication of the consumer, of the normal citizen in Portugal that is used to all these online services, and that's why, we'll talk also a little bit about that later, that's why so many international companies choose Portugal to test products. As you know, we're talking here in the US about um, 4G. We are testing 5G in Portugal. There are some international mobile operators that are testing already 5G in Portugal. That's, that's, that's how, how um, somehow a small population, of course, of 10 million people, but very homogeneous and used to very sophisticated online services and, and, and broadband. That makes us a, a very interesting um, place to test new products. And of course, as I was talking, um, that we are a case study in, in um, e-government and of course we have one of the fastest um, um, uh, entrepreneurial systems these days. It take, takes less than one hour to uh, set up a firm. And if you add that to the multicultural um, um, fundamental base of the, of, of the Portuguese uh, population, that we are very open to foreign countries, that we have of course available international schools, but there is a a, a, a wonderful safety record. Portugal is a very safe country and, and I'm telling you because I know many um, expats from all over the world that decide later to when they retire to buy a house in Portugal and stay there and that's, that's place, that, that has some value, you know, when, when some, some um, um, expats uh, decide to stabilize their life at the end of their um, productive um, term and they decided to stay in Portugal. But as of course, as you know, uh, because of our history, we rank worldwide, actually, number one or number two on the Migrant Integration Policy Index, which is policies towards favorable, pol favorable policies towards the immigrants. Now, um, of course, the best card here is like um, showing the track record, who already decided to be in Portugal and who is happy and who is expanding. So to show an FDI track record is always impressive, of course. This is just um, a group of companies, but if you know that Microsoft, Apple, Xerox, IBM, HP, Cisco, so many American companies are expanding in Portugal. And for example, when you talk about Cisco, um, I just remember that two years ago we were visiting John Chambers and his fantastic team in, in the valley, and he, he on, on, on the record, and this is a public, he was mentioning and said in front of our delegation, look, this is a country where we are expanding, where Cisco is expanding their activities while reducing in other European and other worldwide countries. So Cisco has a worldwide, a global center of operations in Portugal for EMEA, for Europe, Middle East and Africa, and they are keeping expanding. And this is the case, these are the cases that we really appraise. On the right hand side of this um, slide you see the manufacturing sector. I will talk a little bit about that because we did a small industrial revolution in Portugal when we complete our transition from being very skilled um, supplier of, for example, automotive components and entering in the aeronautics. And when you talk about aeronautics, we chose the best partner, which you know Embraer is an, a Brazilian, is the third biggest worldwide maker of airplanes and their first operation in Europe is in Portugal. They just, they had two operations, they just added a third operation and this third is a purely R&D operation. So I will just, um, I gave you around 10 reasons how, how 
why to think about Portugal. So somehow, some, summing up 10 reasons why to invest in Portugal, why to think about Portugal. But now let me just talk, tell you um, briefly about not 10, but yeah, almost 10 uh, sectors where we excel. I'm just going to highlight, and I, I would like to begin on, on, on this because um, we did go on a, a, a transformation uh, from being very competent on automotive components and building cars in Portugal uh, for other brands. You know, there is no Portuguese uh, automotive final uh, consumer brand. But we went to um, the aeronautic sector and the aerospace, and that's where we are now. And the investment of, of Embraer in Portugal was more than symbolic, was just um, fitting our the clusterization of the aeronautic and the aerospace um, sector. If you see on ICT on life sciences, of course, um, I was just just giving a, uh, some interesting um, uh, new uh, contents on this presentation. For example, you know that uh, if uh, Portugal Ventures, which manages um, uh, our um, venture capital, uh, the public venture capital um, efforts in Portugal is an institution called Venture Cap Portugal Ventures. They have a technological um, antenna in, 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 in the valley, in the Silicon Valley. Now it's managed by Nest GSV together with Leadership Business Consulting, a very interesting partnership. And just next week on the 12th of March, we will go to um, Boston where we'll open um, a, new, a brand new partnership with a, an accelerator called Cambridge Innovation Center. We'll bring um, 10 startups only on the life science center there, well basically on the, on, on the biotech uh, area and we will bring them to um, Boston next uh, week and begin this new partnership with, um, with the Cambridge Innovation Center. Just so to tell you that we are also, we're, we're not, um, we also share leadership, we have champions in these sectors and um, several Portuguese companies very well established here in in the, um, in, in the US I just um, for example yeah, uh, last week was um, uh, with the delegation that came with the president of the Republic uh, to San Francisco and Toronto and for example among them the companies there was a company called we do software it's w w e d o we do software and they are world leaders in insurance revenue so their their um, clients are big telcos and all the American big telcos are their their clients and what they do they have these wonderful uh, software programs that um, reduce the redundancy on building um, clients and and they are world leaders on that subsector of ICT. So I've been doing a push now for life science and um, uh, Bial, uh, the Portuguese um, uh, largest pharmaceutical company, um, have been just fully authorized to sell the first 100% uh, Portuguese drug is for epilepsy in the US and you're very, we're very happy about that. This is the very first uh, for Portugal and therefore we're also very active. Just giving you so two examples. One, in the ICT and the other on life sciences of how Portuguese companies also play an important role worldwide and in particular here in the US. Now what we did in the recent past in Portugal was not that we, we in terms of the value of the chain of value in some sectors, we didn't do some, some like some other countries that delocalized too fast, maybe in too quickly to Asia. So we're very keen to have all the value chain in Portugal. And I'll talk with you also about, for example, the, the textile and clothing where when the markets were open to China, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later, but when the markets opened to China and to Asia, let's say 15 or 12, 12, 15 years ago, um, I, I could hear, I could hear many people just saying, wow, countries like Portugal that have very intense textile, clothing, shoes, sectors, they are going to suffer a lot. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. And we have a very, very competitive and very proud, um, and we'll talk about that sectors that were somehow, let's call them, we used to call them traditional sectors, but they are not traditional sectors. They are sectors of tradition. They have been there forever. They've been there for many decades, hundreds of years, but they adopt 
R&D, they adopt innovation, design so eagerly that they are now still on the top. So, and agriculture, fishing and food industry begins on these sectors also where we've been developing very interesting um, companies and products and of course the pulp and paper uh, sector where um, um, you know for example Renove, if you can, you know Renove is a world wide known um, company for their black toilet paper. It is a company that produces toilet paper and tissues, but they have a full range of colors. They and and and, and as you know in their ads, there there are a couple of, um, of celebrities in, for example, in in Hollywood that use it and they've been vocal about that. And that's probably the most exciting and most interesting innovation on that on that sector. And, but Renova, for example, is a wonderful company when, when, especially when I try to portray the innovation on somehow tradition um, sectors. But of course, we have um, um, petrochemical um, uh, um, competence system also. And as you know, for example, uh, the the first item of exports from the from Portugal to the US is. Um, um, refined gas is gasoline, so um, our plants have to be very competitive. You know, on the mining sector, as you know, is a sector that where the Canadians are specializing. There are three or actually four large-scale um, Canadian companies um, doing mining in, in 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 Portugal, where we have very vast. Um, um, deposits of um, ore, copper, zinc, and tungsten. So it's a sector that is quite relevant for Portugal. And now let's go back a little bit for what I was telling about the textile, clothing, and shoes industry. It's quite remarkable how actually after all these um, expectations of, com of competition with, with especially Asia, um, we have we managed to not only keep the jobs and keep the, these hundreds of companies that we have in the sector in Portugal very competitive and, and able to um, present the world with, with, with innovation and, and very competitive um, um, solutions. Um, I will just um, um, jump then to, um, to uh, the four last sectors that I would like to mention. And renewables is something, as you know, that it's uh, where Portugal is a leader. Uh, we were the first country to have, for example, wave energy linked to the grid. So it's not a pilot only. It's not like there are pilots of wave energy um, in, 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 in several places in the world. It's to have um, a pilot area of wave energy where you develop integrate solutions in smart grids and link that energy to the grid so that it's explored in a commercial way. And Portugal was the leader in this sector as it is a leader in, in, um, in a very successful combination of hydro, so water, hydro, um, wind and solar biomass and wave energy. And we are also now taking big steps ahead uh, on um, deep, uh, deep, um, deep um, ocean, uh, deep water uh, windmills. Uh, in the Portuguese electricity utility partner with actually a company from Seattle. It's called the Principal Power. And uh, this partnership, this Portuguese-American partnership, uh, is managing now um, uh, a full uh, commercial um, uh, deep water windmill park uh, in the coast of Portugal. And again, one of my favorite, one of my favorite sectors is the business service sector. Um, if you uh, remember some of the items we talked about uh, more on the um, hard factors that I was mentioning, the competitive costs of energy, of location, um, office space. Plus, if you remember, we we're talking about the flexibility, the multilingual, multilingual ability of the Portuguese, and then you make an a fantastic ecosystem for business services um, sector. And that's why 
you see um, not only Accenture, Deloitte, but also IBM, and as we talk, HP, especially Cisco, Xerox, Ursula Burns, the CEO, was just there last month in Lisbon, last year, sorry, in Lisbon, uh, opening the Global Service Center for Share for Xerox in Europe, and that's what they say. We have um, amazing um, testimonials about uh, and um, uh, good experiences, international business uh, processing uh, services uh, and outsourcing services have in Portugal. And now the very last ones. I would do, actually I could have linked these two sectors with the with them. Um, uh, with the automotive uh, component sector, because this is really they are these sectors are you know like the backbone of the Portuguese industry. They are there. They've been uh, um, adopting um, incredible um, competitive management um, um, processes. And for example, if you see on the metal working on the right side of this slide is a company there in the in the middle called Sodesia. It's a wonderful company. It's located in the north of Portugal, close to Porto in Maia. I was just last week also on them with them with the um, directors of the board here in the U.S. in Detroit. This company from the north of Portugal is able to come to Detroit um, uh, in 2000, in the beginning of 2008. Good timing to acquire a Port um, an American company that was in, in, in deep trouble. They only had one t only a one tier supplier, uh, one tier uh, company client. They acquire a company in Detroit that was that had four factories in the U.S. and two in Canada, six plants, six six factories of automotive components. They do a, a turnaround of management that they put them the company is viable. <coughs> In two years' time, they acquired the 30% that they didn't have from a venture capital fund, and they they now have um, a most successful um, um, industrial production um, investment of Portugal in the U.S. So just to see that, although we are talking about molding industry of metalworking, um, we are talking about um, <coughs> companies that have very very successful management uh, know-how and that are able to come to the US and acquire companies you know to uh, just to identify a target that is suitable for your strategy that it fits your portfolio is quite something but to do it in a in a, in a very um, a successful way is another and and just the case that i just mentioned the sovese group has just done that in the US now we'll just um, we'd like to go to uh, the two uh, last parts of, um, of this seminar. It's important for you to know because if you read, you read the newspapers, you read the economic, you read the entrepreneurial, you read the innovation um, online data, and you, see, you know that Portugal had this chance. We had basically to use this chance to, when we have a reformist agenda and we are committed to do structural reforms, then we, our intention, of course, our objective, our vision is to come out of these three years of adjustment program in a more competitive fashion, in a more competitive way. And that's our, 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 really, our, our target. So we have to tackle in these four pillars that are here listed. And one, of course, is, is has um, a direct link with the judicial system is like how confident our, our uh, investor can be in our structures, how credible how are, are our institutions. And on the second um, um, box you see, um, of course, we have, if you want to be global players, you have to be open to competition, you have to have your um, um, housing market, network industries, energy, telecommunication, transports, open to foreign direct investment and to, to give um, a good and competitive solution to um, a company that is coming to, to Portugal. The third uh, frame you'll see there, it's to have entrepreneur and innovation and labor market flexibility. Um, I will just give you some data. Just the beginning of this week, actually yesterday, um, um, a report came out in the European Union and among 28 countries in, the, in Europe, Portugal was the one where the growth of investment in innovation was bigger, was 39, three, sorry, 3.9%. And this was the biggest 
um, invest the biggest increase of investment in innovation. Of course, we still have a long way to go. We are somehow considered a um, moderate innovator. Of course, we want to be on the, on the top league and we have more to do, but uh, please just bear in mind that a lot was done in these three years. And of course, um, uh, we believe that the since we believe that the the way of the of the of the state companies of the state in the economy was far too big, we had to privatize and we have to change some uh, rules on the public procurement and that's what we did on the privatization side. Uh, you probably were aware we privatized the energy utility, uh, the energy distribution, and um, the airport concessions, uh, and um, we attract investment from all over the world, but uh, mainly so far from Asia and the Middle East, but we're very eager to have um, more American investment also. One of the most interesting um, reforms that uh, we did was to completely um, uh, change um, the tax, uh, the corporate tax system and to have a clear pattern of reduction is and these income tax reductions are uh, are going to put us in um, well together with the exemption regime uh, are going to put us in a very very near future actually now we are already on the term of being compared or possible to compare with tax regimes like in the Netherlands or in Luxembourg and in particular because of the worldwide exemption regime. Uh, the exemption regime and the simplified tax system are already at the level of those somehow many times considered the most competitive in Europe which is the Netherlands and the Luxembourg tax regimes but uh, when we finish them corporate tax um, reduction with the, um, these exemption regimes and the simplified tax system will definitely have a very, very um, competitive tax system. And just the last um, two um, items I would like to talk to you today, which is actually um, a very innovative uh, concept, golden visa, that we call golden visa. Well, to tell uh, the very truth was modeled after the mo the American um, uh, visa approach, uh, uh, but for European countries was a very bold and different move. I mean, this is no other country in Europe has um, a competitive um, golden visa system as ours, and you have just to um, have to fit or to meet one of these three requirements. Either you transfer um, capital in above equal or above 1 million euros or you acquire a real estate and a house in a resort, um, uh, a real estate uh, piece in um, of, of at least 500,000 euros or you create uh, 10 jobs and you can have a golden visa that um, that allows you access free of movements in Europe especially in the, in the so-called Schengen area um, and, and that we believe that is we launched it last year in, in 2013. Uh, we had more than um, oh, almost actually 400 uh, visas attributed, and we believe that uh, we'll have much more, uh, many more uh, in 2014. And just the very last um, um, news also on. Um, incentives for expatriates is a flat rate of 20% on income tax of all the expats that an American company might send to Portugal uh, and this is really um, a novelty in Europe, it's much lower than in other countries and uh, can you imagine a flat rate of 20% and that's been also attracting uh, high added technological companies to Portugal um, because they can send their upper management positions, their um, expatriates and have so low ex um, income tax. I will not go uh, into many details about the um, 
the tax, the, the grants and the incentives um, uh, because that's a little bit too dry. I would just like to leave you with uh, the two last examples that I mentioned. So the corporate tax reform, a new golden visa, a very low, one of the lowest in the world, expect in, um, uh, income taxes as very clear um, measures to attract um, investor support. So we believe that you are coming out of this crisis, of this uh, structural adjustment. We began three years ago. Actually, the very last day of the structural uh, adjustment program is three years, is the 17th of May. Of course, uh, many economic analysts are still debating and of course there is a lot of, um, of reflection about this on the way uh, to exit the adjustment program. There is um, a precedent, you know, Ireland had entered before us in the same kind of um, situation and um, per opposition to Greece that entered also earlier but they had much and many different and deeper problems and it's still stuck on those problems. Ireland had a problem like this for three years and came out in a, what is called a clean way. So um, not, not only proving that it can pay all the debt, the new debt that incurred, but also proving that can have access to the markets on a normal way. So being refinancing its debt on, on a normal way in the markets. And this Portugal is probably going the same way. While well, it's still at the discussion, we have to um, figure out what's what will be the best way to do it if uh, completely on the or as the, the Irish did, what is called the Irish uh, uh, way out, or uh, with some safety pins, with some um, uh, uh, loan um, attached to it to be more uh, sure that the markets are not going to penalize us. You know, because there are so, sometimes there is instability around the world, as, as we know now um, that we have this um, trouble in Ukraine, but just sometimes there's instability around the world and the markets react in a very tough way. So um, we have really to think uh, very um, um, thoughtfully about, about this, but it's um, just two months uh, to go and we will come up with, um, with a good solution, I'm sure. So I really want to give space for um, uh, questions. And I first, I really thank uh, Palkus for this uh, opportunity and particularly Angel Simons for organizing it. And um, I'm really um, happy to receive questions now or, or uh, you can also reach me by email. You saw my email in the very one of the first slides, but it's um, Rui, so ruy.boavish.marks at portugalglobal.pt. So I really thank you very much, Park, for this opportunity. And again, thank you for sharing the time with me. Um, I will be here in New York for several more years. So please uh, contact me um, uh, for any question you might have related with Portugal. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Louis. There was a ton of information there. So I'm glad we've captured this uh, as a recording so people can go back and watch it um, on YouTube at any time. We do have some questions that have come in uh, from our attendees. The first one is, do you have any statistics on safety in Portugal? On safety? Well, um, I don't have in my hand now um, statistics, but, but they, it's so easy to find. <laughs> Um, uh, the person who asked the question, please, I mean, if you can identify yourself by any means or send me an email because we go to the OECD or we go to the United Nations or we go to any um, service provider and uh, you'll be surprised at our, how, how safe Portugal is and that's why actually we are such um, a, a tourism destination. Um, a place not only, I mean, for business destination, not, not only as a business destination, but also as a tourism destination. Actually, the United States was responsible for um, the biggest increase of uh, tourists to Portugal last, last year. Uh, the income from the American tourists increased almost 24%, and uh, the number of tourists was uh, also 18% plus. So we are assisting to a surge of, of uh, 
of um, more and more Americans going to Portugal, and that plays also a role. It's because the, the perception of safety is very big. And uh, actually, everybody that goes there, you can also find some testimonials on, you know, just on, on Facebook or, or whatever, that people really um, uh, feel comfortable in, in, in Portugal, that um, somehow the Portuguese people are hospitable people, that we welcome foreigners, and that is not only for the business purpose, but also for the tourism, tourism purpose, is quite um, uh, possible to, to prove that, if you want some statistics, yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I have to say, personally, my experience is every time I visited the country, I've always felt very safe, um, so that's, that's good to hear. Another question, would also love to hear about how Portugal might be considered a gateway to the rest of Europe? And I think you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but maybe expand a little bit on, on how that happened, um, Portugal serving as a gateway to Europe. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Angela, for pinpointing that in a more clear way. Uh, is that is not only like because of geographical reasons, okay, um, Portugal is the closest country to the U.S. in terms of uh, miles in terms of, uh, of actually physical distance, but it, it does make a difference if you uh, arrive in a European country that is welcoming, that has is able to do reforms. We know that we have many things to to um, better in Portugal, to uh, correct, to we have a long, a very long list of things that we have to to um, improve. But with these three years of crisis, we've proven what we we proved to the world, which and we can share all that is that. Um, Portugal is not only a much better country after these three years of crisis, um, uh, also that not only being welcoming and having these low costs of investment, have, uh, not only having this pool of talent, that you can um, establish your own operations in Portugal. Like, for example, I give you a, an example of a, a, a Silicon Valley company, Monkey Survey, that has its European base um, operations in Portugal and, um, and, uh, and many others, like Cisco, I told you others. So, therefore, definitely Portugal for some sectors more than others. I would say for services probably more than uh, for manufacturing, um, but, well, it depends on the priorities on, on, and on how an individual company would have his um, business case model, but for probably more for services than, than industry properly, uh, Portugal is an ideal gateway to Europe and, as I was telling in the beginning, of the, especially these two markets, not only the 500 million marketplace that we have in Europe, but also the 250 million people that are Portuguese speaking. And I can tell you we have several testimonials also of American companies that are eager to enter the Angola or Mozambique or even Brazil market and they can partner, they can use the Portuguese talent, not only the language availability but all the cultural links that they've been establishing with these countries for centuries that to be able to uh, have an easy access to those markets. And therefore, Portugal as a platform, as a gateway for American companies to enter Europe and also all the other Portuguese-speaking um, countries. Excellent. Um, our next question is, what are the examples of any new types of exports happening? You mentioned exports from Portugal to the U.S. Yes, I believe so. Or yeah, well, well, if you're talking, as you know, and as I told in the beginning, um, we have around 2,200 companies exporting regularly to the U.S., and that's and that you export almost 2.5 more, 2.5 times more to the U.S. than the U.S. to Portugal. So our pattern of exports to the U.S. is much more diversified than the other way around. And what I can say is that on the sectors, on the 10 sectors that I showed to you, you have innovation in all of them. I mentioned, for example, we do, the software company, but there are more. There are out systems. There are many other companies that have strong, um, well, critical software for sure. That was the first company that, and, and actually to have to service NASA and um, while out, out system serves the U.S. Army. And as you know, NASA and the U.S. Army have very you know, a stringent, difficult criteria to get in 
and we have the software companies, um, the purchase of software companies in very well positioned there. So you do have a lot of innovation and uh, novel products, but it's interesting to see, for example, that even in the what as going back to the our talk about the the so-called traditional sectors, for example, in fashion and cork. Uh, what we uh, we could see is like um, a company called Pelcor with a very innovative leader called Sandra Correa and she's been exporting I don't know if you saw because the Mo the MoMA Museum the Museum of Modern Art here in New York had a campaign ten, um, in 2010 so um, yeah three years ago uh, that had the Pelcor um, rain umbrellas umbrellas made of cork which is an outstanding innovation product and that and now this Pelcor company is making fashion goods um, wearable fashion goods uh, with with cork in, in all sorts of colors very attractive really with this laminated very thin um, uh, waterproof um, uh, uh, textile made um, oh, sorry cork made uh, that looks like a textile and therefore uh, you really um, have many innovative products coming out of Portugal that are not only on these um, spheres of, you know, these er areas of IT, um, life science, biotech, pharma. Uh, there are other sectors where we are able to bring products. And of course, I mean, the other sectors, you know, um, wine, olive oil, uh, that we have so many companies coming to the U.S. and, and you know, improving our, mar our market share here in, 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 uh, in very competitive um, sub-segments of the market, but also doing very, quite well. Angela. Excellent. <clears throat> we have another one about education. How is the education system changing to meet the needs of the next gen generation workforce? Well, that's actually a very good question. Uh, we have a long way to do. Uh, we know that, you know, it's, um, we all know about, about these bipolar uh, illnesses when we have uh, really ups and downs. And, um, and Portugal has a little bit uh, through his history a little bit um, um, a bipolar situation on education. We have a very well trained young generation. We we really do. Um, I'm not exaggerating. We really have very a very good pool of talent and knowledge on the younger generations. But the older generations, we have an issue there. We do have. Uh, there are older generations that are not so well trained, that didn't capture well this transformation of, um, of uh, industries to more innovative um, uh, production methodology, for example. And so we have an issue there. And, but to reply to that question, I, would, I, I can only focus on, on, on the younger generations and say that all these um, this, um, the fact that Nova Business School and the Catholic Lisbon, Lisbon Business School are among the, are on the top 20 business schools worldwide. Um, so we have really higher education that is reaching um, an international um, top level. But I do have to say that we still struggle with all the generations qualification. And that's an issue for Portugal. But since um, but we have a possible good way out there, which is since those what we call typically the old traditional sectors like the textiles, the home textiles, the fashion goods, the shoes sectors have been improving a lot. We've been pouring money on qualification of those um, of those um, um, employees of those. So the training the training of older generations is an issue, is a challenging one. We are tackling it, but it exists. So if you're talking only about the other segment, which is like the younger generations, I think we are creating a, a wonderful um, platform for knowledge creation for, uh, and you see the level of startups. Lisbon is showing now on on the top 10 um, most exciting cities for, for startups. Of course, you know, there are other ones in Europe, and especially London is really special. But um, uh, Lisbon is beginning to show 
on those charts of top places in the worldwide for entrepreneurship and startups. And that means a lot for the, the quality of the younger generations. I wonder if I replied uh, to the question, but I, I think it's fair enough to say that, to, 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 to explain these two situations that we have in Portugal. Excellent. And this is our last question as we're coming up on the hour. With the spotlight on fellow Portuguese-speaking country Brazil, can you tell us a bit about the business relations between Portugal and Brazil? Oh my God, that's that's a good question because you know you know what um, Portugal and Brazil have been there forever, as you know. It was um, it's a it's a unique case in the world. You might not know it so clearly, where a, a, you know we had an empire. Now it, it doesn't sound very good to say the word empire, but it was at that time in the 16th century, 17th century. Portugal had an empire of of, of colonies, and 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 um, there is only one case in the world where one where the of this empire this empire the capital of the empire that used to be in Lisbon moved to Brazil moved to Rio de Janeiro and for almost 30 years the capital of this empire that was led by an European country was not in in Europe was in Brazil and the way the Brazilians got independence which everybody knows was the Blood was not shared. It was an, a peaceful independence. Uh, it's also unique in historical ground. So, um, our relation between the relation between Portugal and Brazil is a very unique one, very deep, and actually um, outstanding from the point of view not only of historical reasons that was I was mentioning, but of of of, um, of uh, the potential of joint ventures, for example, having now. One example, the Portuguese biggest telecom company, PT, merging with the second biggest in the in Brazil called OI, which is O I OI, and creating a, a true a true um, transatlantic um, um, business venture between the Portuguese and and the Brazilians, and also the investment of Embraer, so the third largest. Um, aeronautical company uh, in the world investing in Portugal as the first investment in Europe. This translates a lot about not only the, the way uh, the bilateral relation is, but also the potential that we have ahead of us. Excellent. Thank you very much, Louis. Um, if we didn't get to your question, as I mentioned, you can uh, send them to talkers at talkers.org or directly to Louis. Um, and uh, we will be posting this um, uh, webinar, the recording, the actual video recording, on our YouTube channel very shortly. And the PDF of the presentations will be posted to our website and our Facebook page. So we encourage everybody to share these uh, resources with family and friends. Um, and if you have a suggestion for a topic for a webinar, we are very open to, to lots of different topics. So we, would, we definitely want to hear from you. So with that, I will uh, say adios, and thank you for attending, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.